During the last year, in the United States, there were approximately 10,000 open heart operations performed in which one or more heart valves were removed and replaced with an artificial device. And yet, the era of prosthetic heart valves began less than 20 years ago, in 1954, when Dr. Charles Huffnagel of Georgetown University introduced a mechanical device which partially relieved aortic regurgitation. This prosthesis consisted of a plastic ball enclosed within a lucite cage which was designed to be rapidly placed in the descending thoracic aorta. External fixation rings held this prosthesis in place. Although the plastic valve was extremely noisy, thrombogenic, and relieved regurgitation from only the lower half of the body, it was of benefit to many patients and represented the first attempt at repairing cardiac valvular dysfunction with a mechanical device. In the late 1950s, several surgeons, including Huffnagel, Henry Bonson, and Dwight Magoon, began replacing single damaged cusps of the aortic valve. In 1958, in a two-stage procedure, Dr. William H. Muller of the University of Virginia first totally removed an aortic valve and separately replaced each cusp. Early in 1959, Dr. Muller performed the first successful operation in which a damaged heart valve was completely removed and replaced with an artificial device. This tricuspid Teflon prosthetic heart valve was used for the next several years by many cardiac surgeons. A later modification by Drs. Muller and James Littlefield added more circumferential support to this Teflon prosthesis. Hemodynamically, this was a very acceptable alternate to the natural aortic valve. It was not obstructive, was totally free of embolic difficulties and was completely silent. Unfortunately, after 12 to 24 months, these Teflon leaflets stiffened and cracked, resulting in recurrent aortic stenosis and regurgitation. And most of these leaflet valves were eventually replaced with later models of artificial heart valves. The first complete replacement of the mitral valve was performed at the National Heart Institute in 1960 by doctors Andrew G. Morrow and Nina Brownwald. They employed an artificial heart valve constructed of polyurethane foam reinforced with saffron fabric. The leaflets were controlled by artificial cordy tendinii which were brought through the left ventricular free wall and then adjusted to proper length and tension. Later, Dr. Louis Dupuisy and Dr. Morrow developed a bicuspid prosthesis made of Teflon fabric that was successfully implanted in South Africa. These fabric microvalves suffered the same fate as those used in the aortic position. It was becoming obvious that any artificial heart valve using flexible components was entirely dependent upon the flex life of the material used, and so attention was redirected to the use of rigid materials. Early in 1960, both Dr. Dwight Harkin of the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston and Dr. Albert Starr of the University of Oregon were developing artificial heart valves utilizing the caged ball principle. Dr. Starr successfully implanted such a prosthesis in September of 1960 
Since that time, rigid materials have been used in the manufacture of prosthetic heart valves. The only exception to this was a Teflon-coated bisilicone tricusted prosthetic valve, which was developed by Dr. Huffnagel in the late 1960s. This valve underwent extensive and fairly rapid leaflet damage with large depositions of thrombus above the leaflets, and its use was quickly discontinued. In 1962, Dr. Harkin outlined the basic design criteria for the optimal prosthetic heart valve. It should have lasting physical and geometric features, and it should be capable of permanent fixation in the normal anatomic site. It should be chemically inert, non-thrombogenic, harmless to blood elements, and it must not annoy the patient. Patient annoyance can refer to many things. Excessive noise generated when two rigid materials strike each other, and such factors as the nuisance of lifelong anticoagulation. It must open and close promptly during the appropriate phase of the cardiac cycle, and it should offer no resistance to physiologic flows. Since 1962, at the Clinic of Surgery of the National Heart and Lung Institute, the vast majority of prosthetic heart valves placed in the aortic or mitral position have been of the Star Edwards caged ball variety. Before discussing the evolution of the design of the Star Edwards valve, a discussion of its anatomy is necessary. At first glance, the mechanics of this valve seem simple enough, but it must be remembered that there are three distinct orifices which must be considered when implanting this type of prosthesis. The primary orifice represents the area of the inflow orifice at the seat of the valve. The secondary orifice is encountered when the ball is fully open and represents the area, a truncated cone, between the ball and the valve seat. The tertiary orifice represents the area between the diameter of the ball and the surrounding tissue, be it aorta or ventricular cavity. The next two photographs show examples of aortic valves in which tertiary orifice obstruction was present. Both are viewed from above through sectioned aorta. The area between the ball in the open position and the adjoining aortic wall is too small, and a significant obstruction to forward flow has occurred. The first Star Edwards valves, Series 1000 for the aortic position and 6000 for the mitral position, were implanted in 1961. The aortic model is recognizable by the silastic ball and the three metal studs that project from the valve seat. This early aortic valve had a thromboembolism rate of about 20%. The mitral prosthesis, the 6000 series, is recognizable by its heavy metal base and thick struts. This valve had an incidence of thromboembolic complications which exceeded 50%. The greatest complication of these early Star Edwards valves was in the silastic ball. This silastic underwent lipid infiltration 
which led to changes in the shape of the ball, both shrinkage with ball escape and swelling, with cracking of the ball, which led to improper movement of the ball in the cage and a predisposition to thromboembolus formation. In 1966, the 1000 and 6000 series were discontinued. The new aortic models, 1200 and then 1260, featured new techniques of curing the silastic ball and extended the cloth to cover the inflow orifice. The 1260 aortic model and the 6120 mitral prosthesis, which has a greatly reduced metal base, continue in fairly widespread use. These models have a greatly lowered incidence of thromboembolism and are very quiet. At the National Heart and Lung Institute, we are personally reluctant to use any silastic ball. And we are apprehensive that the newer curing techniques will not eliminate, but only delay lipid and fatty acid infiltration and eventual deterioration of the silastic. In 1967, there was a major modification of the Star Edwards prosthesis. In an effort to reduce the incidence of thromboembolism, a completely cloth-covered cage was introduced which utilized a hollow metal ball of Stellite 21 which has the same specific gravity as blood. The cloth-covered models Series 2300 for aortic implantation and 6300 for the mitral position had several difficulties. Tissue ingrowth occurred about the primary orifice, thus decreasing the area and establishing unacceptable gradients across the valve. In actuality, this tissue ingrowth at the valve seat could pile up and cause both primary and secondary orifice obstruction. Tears and fragmentation of the single layer of cloth cover also occurred with some frequency. The 2300 and 6300 series were modified to the 2310 and 6310 series, respectively. This series incorporated a composite seat of metal studs projecting through the cloth upon which the ball seats. These seem to have eliminated the problem of tissue ingrowth at the primary orifice. This series also introduced a two-ply cloth cover, which has decreased cloth wear. In certain of the 2310 series, a disastrous complication occurred. A close clearance model was introduced in 1970, in which the transverse distance between the poppet and the cage was reduced. These valves impacted in the open position with the acute onset of massive aortic regurgitation and sudden death. This complication was also seen in the 6310 series of mitral valves. This flaw was quickly eliminated and the present 2320 aortic and 6320 mitral prostheses have evolved.
these models are currently in use in our clinic. They feature a metal poppet, the composite seat, a wide distance between cage and poppet, which flares even more near the apex, and a two-ply cloth cover. Concern about the two-ply cloth undergoing wear and fragmentation has led Edwards Laboratory to introduce a new series, 2400 and 6400, which features a thin inner metal track, which is the only part of the covered cage which contacts the ball, thus preventing damage to the cloth cover. This model is in a developmental stage, and its major drawback is an excessive amount of noise. Many other caged ball type artificial heart valves have been and are currently in use in the United States. One of the most unique of these is the McGovern sutureless prosthesis. In this valve, sharp metal spikes contained in the seat are circumferentially impacted into the aortic annulus to keep the valve in position. This has the advantage of a shorter operating time, but the disadvantage of a high incidence of parabasilar leaks in the hands of the surgeon who is not thoroughly experienced in proper implantation techniques. It also uses a silastic ball. One instance for which the McGovern prosthesis is particularly suited is when the aortic annulus is extremely friable, secondary to either infection or extensive calcific or myxomatous degeneration. In this situation, the McGovern prosthesis can be wedged into position and secured with good chances of remaining in place. The smell-off cutter caged ball prosthesis is a double cage of titanium with a silastic ball. This design allows a smaller ball to be used than is possible in the Star Edwards models. Since the ball does not seat on the ring, but passes through it to seat on the cage underneath. The DeBakey caged ball prosthesis made by Surge Tool, features a pyrolite carbon ball. The present Harkin prosthesis has a cloth-covered cage, a metal ball, and a plastic cover about the seat. Another caged ball prosthesis, which is in widespread use, is the brown wall cutter valve. The concept of a cloth cover for a caged ball prosthesis was developed by doctors Brownwald and Morrow in this clinic. The rationale was to eliminate thromboembolic complications and was suggested to them by observation of a thin ingrowth of tissue which occurred in the early Muller valves. Dr. Brownwald's investigative work, which demonstrated the efficacy of the cloth cover in reducing thromboembolism, led both Cutter and Edwards Laboratories to use cloth covering in their caged ball prosthesis. The brown walled cutter valve features a complete thin fabric cover. Which permits an ingrowth of a very thin layer of autologous tissue 
which does not compromise the diameter of the inflow orifice. A silicone ball is used. When the ventricular cavity is large, the caged ball prosthesis is a satisfactory valve. However, when the left ventricular cavity is small, as it usually is in pure mitral stenosis, the caged ball is often not acceptable. Not only can the ball obstruct flow out of the left ventricle, as pointed out in the middle diagram, but if the ball is in contact with ventricular muscle, inflow to the left ventricular cavity can be obstructed. It is also possible for a mitral prosthesis, if it is large and placed too high, to impede closing of an aortic prosthesis in a double valve replacement. However, the most common problem with a caged ball mitral valve is simply that the ventricular cavity is too small to contain it and a form of tertiary orifice obstruction occurs. In an effort to solve this problem of size, the disc type valvular prosthesis was developed. This valve uses a lens shaped poppet which occupies a much smaller portion of the ventricular cavity. Early prototypes of these valves were developed by Dr. Jerome K. of the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, Drs. Cross and Jones, and Drs. Earl K. and Suzuki, all of Cleveland. Dr. Dwight Harkin was also a pioneer in the development of disc valves, as was Dr. Marceau Cervell of Paris. There is only a small pressure gradient between the atrium and ventricle during diastole, and thrombosis has been a great difficulty in these disc valves. Efforts to decrease the amount of exposed metal, as seen in the recent K. Shiley valve and the recent Harkin valve, have decreased but not eliminated the problem of thrombosis. Another difficulty with disc valves is muscle ingrowth from the left ventricle wall, which prevents normal function of the disc. Loose cordae have also obstructed the low profile valve. In an effort to prevent muscle from the left ventricular free wall from obstructing the disc, a recent modification of the K. Shiley valve has a muscle guard which protects the disc from this type of obstruction. Edwards Laboratory has also made a disc valve. The early model, series 6500, used a stellite metal disc, which had a very high incidence of thromboembolism, and this has been modified to the 6520 series. Thromboembolism with this prosthesis has been reduced, but not eliminated. The Cooley blood well prosthesis has also been discontinued because of an unacceptable incidence of thromboembolism. A very popular mitral valve prosthesis, which is currently in widespread use, is the Bell valve, manufactured by Surgitool. 
This prosthesis features a background velour covering. Initial experience shows a very low incidence of thromboembolism with this prosthesis. Recently, the Cooley Cutter disc prosthesis has been introduced. In this valve, the disc is smaller than the internal orifice of the prosthesis and sits on the upstream retaining struts. This principle allows small amounts of controlled regurgitation, which washes the disc and minimizes the chances of disc impingement. The retaining struts have no cross members, which eliminates a focus for thrombosis. This illustration demonstrates the potential for improved flow in the Cooley cutter prosthesis. One can see the symmetrical but restricted flow that occurs when the disc is larger than the primary orifice. On the bottom is seen the increase in central flow that is afforded by use of the smaller disc, regardless of the low profile principle of disc valves, tertiary orifice obstruction due to small size of the ventricular cavity can still occur. One other type of artificial heart valve employs a disc on a pivot, which gives unobstructed central flow. An early model of this principle was used by van der Spey. In this cloth covered toilet seat valve, the spring pivot point above the valve represented an area of stagnant flow and offered great potential for thrombus formation. The tilting disc valves, which are popular today, all have projecting pivot points with eccentric openings and areas of turbulence and stasis. The WADA valve has recently been taken off the market because of a high incidence of thromboembolism. The disc in this valve is fixed, and thrombosis occurred at these fixed points. We are impressed with the bjork shiley prosthesis, which employs the same basic principle but in which the tilting disc is not fixed. Hence it can rotate and is in that respect self-cleaning. The bjork shiley prosthesis is our choice in aortic valve replacement in children or when the annulus or aortic root are small. It is also quite acceptable for use within an arterial graft. Besides artificial materials, there has been a large amount of time directed at the use of biological tissues in the manufacture of prosthetic heart valves. Biological valves have been made of fascia lata and pericardium, and heart valves from human cadavers and animals have been employed. In most cases, late fibrosis and calcification with recurrent stenosis and regurgitation have been the rule. An exception to this has been the Reese Hancock porcine xenograft. This valve, which was designed by Dr. Robert Reese here at the National Heart and Lung Institute for the mitral or tricuspid position, uses a pig aortic valve, which is fixed and sterilized with glutaraldehyde 
and mounted on a flexible stent. The valve has a low gradient, cannot be obstructed by the left ventricle in diastole, and requires no anticoagulation. Our experience with this prosthesis is into the fourth year, and to date there have been no instances of thromboembolism or other sign of valve failure. Here is a valve which was removed at eight months because of a parabasilar leak, which demonstrates no sign of deterioration of the tissue leaflets. These then represent most of the attempts at artificial construction of heart valves. It is obvious that none of them can compare with our natural valves, nor have Dr. Harkin's criteria laid down in 1962 been met. Progress in technical developments and modifications of these valves will continue. And if the next 15 years are as fruitful as the last, then we shall see many more exciting developments in artificial heart valves. After this motion picture was completed, a historical inaccuracy and a significant omission were discovered by the authors. In September of 1958, three months prior to the first aortic valve replacement by Dr. Muller, Dr. C. Walton Lilly High of the University of Minnesota successfully replaced a cardiac valve in the normal anatomic position. Following an unsuccessful commissurotomy and debridement, an aortic valve was excised and a silastic flap placed in the subcoronary position as depicted above. The patient survived for at least 23 months. One other such procedure was successfully performed by Dr. Lillyhigh the following year. We also failed to mention the silastic butterfly leaflet prosthetic heart valve designed by Drs. Vincent Gott and Ronald Daggett of the University of Wisconsin. These valves were implanted clinically from 1963 to 1965 in both the aortic and mitral position. A number of these valves that were inserted eight to 10 years ago are still functioning well. Their use was discontinued because of an unacceptable incidence of thrombosis that occurred on the downstream side of the leaflet at the area of the hinge site. 